So what I do at the garden is I think about plant combinations in terms of like what actually grows together. You know, what, what makes up a plant community because the gardens that I take care of are representative of actual plant communities in the Southeastern United States. So this talk is a little bit outside of my box because I'm not thinking about what ought to grow together. This, is to, this talk is about like what looks good together and what you might want to try in your garden. So starting with this first slide, I think I'm going to give you, um, my goal is to give you some good ideas and also to tell you why everything that I'm going to tell you is something that you should throw out the window and just do, you know, do what comes naturally in your garden. So um, this picture right here um, was taken in the Piedmont habitat here at the garden. And let me digress for one more minute to say that we are open. We've been open for, oh. um, I don't know, month, month and a half now. Um, okay. And as of today, what is open is the gardens. The buildings aren't open yet. The gift shop, the exhibits aren't open yet. But um, that might change on Tuesday. That's slated to change on Tuesday. So when we get to the end of this, if I haven't wasted all of my allotted time, I'll tell you how to shop for plants. And um, right now, that's only uh, op it's the only way to do that is online. But come Tuesday, our plant sale will be back up too. So more options. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, this is that um, same scene a little bit later in the year, not as good a picture, but man, look at all that stuff happening in there. So the, the real point that I wanted to make here isn't that Indian paintbrush and Tiarella is a beautiful combination that you should try at home, because probably most of you guys are familiar with Indian paintbrush and know that it's not an easy thing to grow at home. But the point that I'm trying to make here is in real life, you would never see these two things growing together. So probably most of us are familiar with having stumbled upon um, foam flower or tiarella in the woods in a like rich soil, moist, shady-ish spot. Um, and if any of us have encountered the Indian paintbrush before, it's out in the blazing sun, you know, probably in a little remnant patch of, you know, halfway decent Piedmont Prairie, um, or at least that's where it grows down here. So not things that you would think of as growing together. And in this part of the Piedmont habitat at the Botanical Garden, um, I'm actually just showing off Piedmont plants horticulturally and not trying to be representative of any particular community. And I planted the Indian paintbrush in there. I didn't plant the foam flower in there. The foam flower came in from a different planting in the Piedmont habitat. And it did so because even though this bed is sunny and very sloping, and you would think that maybe it would be dry because it's fairly well drained, um, it's new. And so there are no tree roots in it and it is pretty wet. And so it's a great spot for the foam flower, even though it is in the full sun. And these two plants together are amazing. It's not a thing that I ever would have thought to do it's a thing that happened on its own and there's no way I'm gonna take that foam flower out of there because I love it. Um, so early in the season, you just enjoy all the foam flower and the Indian paintbrush together. And then as the season goes on, you know, the foreground, you've got um, the lobed tick seed and then behind the foam flower, you can see some blue there. That's the lyre leaf sage. And what I forgot to put in the slide um, is the Golden Alexanders, which is in the background. And I'm gonna talk about all of these things more as I go on with the talk. But the point that I want to make here is, you know, we can do all of the research and we can listen to all of the experts about where a person should grow a thing. And, you know, when you also embrace and rely upon happy accident, I think um, that's where some of my favorite things happen. Um, here's another example of that. So this is um, back, at, at, for those of you who haven't been to the botanical garden, we've got a pretty great carnivorous plant collection. And um, these pots are adjacent to it. And we moved some of them just last year. So if you look way in the background, you can see a low pot that has some orange in it. And that orange is um, butterfly milkweed. 
So butterfly milkweed, another plant that likes a lot of sun. It's real tolerant of um, dry growing conditions. That that plant has been in that pot for years. It's terribly overgrown. There's hardly any dirt, um, and yet it does just fine. It thrives in there. In the foreground, you can see some orange milkwort, which does not tolerate dry conditions at all. Um, you see it growing down in the coastal plain with the pitcher plants, you know, in, in longleaf savannas and wet savannas. So it likes wet soil, it likes a lot of sun, um, same kind of conditions that the pitcher plants like low nutrient acidic. So in order to have a combination of orange milkwort and butterfly milkweed, it's just not a thing that I would think of. They definitely have different growing requirements, not like kind of like the Indian paintbrush and the foam flower, but really different. Um, and here they are blooming together as a total happy accident as we moved pots around. So that's fun too. So um, embrace the happy accident. And um, with that, I will move on to the sort of more standard. This is the sort of things that you don't need an accident. You can actually plan for. So um, the idea for this talk came in one of the issues of conservation, or maybe it was the, when we were starting to put together the magazine that we um, share with our members. And there was this idea that we would have a section that would be staff picks. And like the initial idea was like, we'll pick a few plants that you like together and we'll do this every issue and you know just sort of give people an idea of a thing to do in the garden so the whole horticulture staff was sitting around a table sort of brainstorming what are our favorite plant combinations and across the board this right here was the winner so this is um something that you see every year down in the mountain habitat in the garden it is um columbine there's the red in the foreground, and then a little bit behind that, you can see the eastern blue phlox, and then that yellow haze in the background is the golden ragwort. So down in the mountain habitat, um, early in the spring, so the spring ephemerals, the trilliums and the bloodroot and the spring beauties, and those, those things are already up and going, but as the garden leaves out, we're not really used to seeing color yet, all of a sudden, bam, this thing happens and it's beautiful. Um, and it makes everybody happy after after as winter is coming to a close. So the mountain habitat is um, shady, pretty rich soil, um, pretty moist, and those are great growing conditions for these three things. It's um, so you know the sort of obvious what makes a good combination that they bloom at the same time or at least look to get look good together whether or not they're blooming at the same time and that they have similar growing conditions so here we've got um you know that these plants are all tolerant of a little bit of shade um they all do like a little bit of moisture um and some some you know richer good garden soil so uh, you know i think what's particularly eye-catching about this is that you know these three colors that just look really nice together um personally red and yellow i would not say is my favorite color combination in the garden but the columbine is a soft red and it has a lot of yellow in it so it actually looks really nice with the golden ragwort so as i have described the growing conditions for this set of plants a lot of us don't have that kind of moisture the golden ragwort in particular is one that really does like a wetter spot so i'm about to show you essentially the same converse, uh, combination but for a drier sunnier spot so this is out in front of the education center um, we still have the columbine, which is also, you know, does does tolerate a lot more sun and a lot drier conditions than the other two necessarily do. And then instead of the phlox, we have um, one of the NCBG um, hybrid baptisias. So purple smoke is a nice purple um, baptisia, blooms early in the spring. It's a whole lot bigger than the phlox, so that um, eastern blue phlox is like maybe a couple feet tall, really nice sort of ground cover, good shade garden plant. Whereas this Baptisia is more like three feet tall, um, gets bigger as it gets older and more established. Um, 
really nice flowers in the spring, but after it's done blooming, as the growing season goes on, it continues to add foliage and kind of holds its place in the garden, more like a small shrub. Um, it's, it's big for a perennial, takes up a lot of space, um, but in a, in a lovely way. And then instead of the golden ragwort in here, we have the sun drops. Um, the columbine and the sun drops are a couple plants that are going to come up more than once in this talk. And one of the, you know, one of the things that helps make a plant be a good combiner is if it has a long bloom time. So it can associate well with lots of other things. And both the columbine and the sun drops both bloom for a nice long time. So the sun drops gives us that yellow that we were getting from the golden ragwort, but um, it's much more drought tolerant um, and happy, happy out there in a drier, sunnier spot. So there's option two. Here's option three. So here we've got the columbine and the phlox, but instead for the yellow, I have some golden alexanders here. So Golden Alexanders is, uh, it's a wonderful plant that can also be a horrible plant, but mostly a wonderful plant. So one of the, one of the reasons that um, we love this one is because it's the larval host plant for parsley worm or the black swallowtail caterpillar. So you see that sweet little caterpillar there sort of, typically I see this late in the, late in the summer, all of a sudden, um, you look at the golden alexanders and wonder where all the foliage has gone. And if you look carefully, you see all of these awesome little caterpillars all over the place. And then it's not too long before you start seeing the butterflies. Um, it's really nice blooms early in the spring. So um, the, this, this talk is mostly chronological. So we've started at the beginning of the growing season. So, um, you know, that first set, with the, the golden ragwort is blooms earlier than sun drops or golden alexanders. So we're working our way a little bit forward, but um, this golden alexanders is, is an early bloomer as well. Um, it does very well in a wet spot, but it can be a little bit thuggish in a wet spot. So if you've got the right spot, um, it will be successful and you'll have lots of it and you can feed lots of parsley worms. But the downside is unlike say the columbine or the phlox, um, if you wind up with more of it than you want, the um, golden alexanders is in the um, carrot family, the APAC family, and um, it's got a nice root to it and it's hard to get out of the ground. So you can't just pull it when you decide you've got more of it than you want. You've got a little bit of a project on your hands, but then maybe you can share it with another one of your gardener friends and they can grow more parsley worms and you can have more black swallowtails. Um, I have been told, I can't say that I've tried this myself, but um, if you grow it in dry shade, it will still bloom and just won't be happy enough to really do a whole lot of seeding in. I actually grow this one at home in um, fairly wet shade and it does not bloom the way it does in the sun, but I still do get blooms and it's still there to feed the caterpillars for me. So um, it's got its pluses and minuses, but those caterpillars and those butterflies are big plus. Okay, so here is our columbine again and a different flock. So it's a little bit tricky to see, um, at least on my monitor, um, the color of this. It looks a little bit purpley, but if you see this in real life, it's quite pink. Um, and one of the reasons this is in the talk is because um, I have a tendency, I'm, I, I love to talk about Piedmont plants. I live in the Piedmont. There are so many great Piedmont plants. I can't help myself. It tends to be a focus. So I was pushing myself to get outside of the Piedmont. And this is this um, the common name, I guess, says it all. Mountain Flux is from the mountains. So this was a funny thing. When we built the education center, I think it's about eight years ago now, um, we had grown a lot of plants from seed and here we had all this new space that we were like trying new things out and here we planted um, this Phlox Oveda which had a different name back then um, but um, planted it out there this mountain Phlox out in the full blazing sun at the education center and man did it take off it really did amazing things and it was beautiful and one of the things that I really like about this plant 
is um, instead of just being a single shade of pink, there's a, there's a lot of variations. So I don't know how much of it is like plant to plant variation or how much of it is within plant variation, because, you know, one of the nice things about growing things from seed is you do get some genetic variation that, you know, does does result in sometimes more in a more interesting color palette but um the the phlox is you know ranges from like a pale pink to a bright pink some of them have more white in them so visually it's really interesting and um part of the reason why i included it in this talk was because year in and year out i kept taking pictures of the same thing so obviously it was a color combination that just kept appealing to me. Um, so this flox is, we're getting a little bit later in the season. So it was sort of later spring into summer. I like that picture a lot, but um, this is a little bit. Um, so the flox is maybe two and a half, three feet tall, um, average to moist soil, um, does well in the full sun. And I've never tried this in the shade. Um, I bet it would do okay in some shade, but obviously pretty spectacular in the sun. So here's that flux again with the Coreopsis auriculata. So this was in the first, um, in that first slide with the paintbrush and the um, foam flower. This combination will knock your socks off. Um, it might make you nauseous as well. We all have our own sort of ideas and tolerances about what makes a good color combination. This one, uh, you know, this this slide is so lurid to me, and I think that in real life it's probably even worse slash better. But man, it's so striking. You just are not going to miss it, and you're definitely going to stop and look at it. So, um, you know, these plants are both sort of similar in scale. The phlox is a little bit taller. Then the Coreopsis is, this Coreopsis um, is maybe two feet tall. One of the really nice things about this Coreopsis is when it's done blooming. So this time of year, um, uh, trying to think, maybe maybe by like late summer, um, this Phlox makes a really nice ground cover. It has really nice um, basal foliage. And it really, you know, once the flowering stalks are gone, that basal foliage holds its place in the garden pretty well. So it's still doing work for you, you know, even long after it's done flowering. Um, there is a period, you know, shortly after it's done flowering where you've got these old flowering stalks and it's a little bit unlovely, but at that stage of the game, you know, we're sort of in the late spring, early summer. There's so much stuff going on in the garden that you really don't, you're really not troubled by it. And as the season goes on, that basal foliage comes back and it's really quite nice. So that um, we're going to see that lobed tick seed in a number of these slides. And that is the sort of gold, the gold or yellow in this picture. Um, the other yellows are the sun drops, which I already mentioned. And then down in the lower right corner, you can see some green and gold. Um, green and gold is a plant that works great in combination with all kinds of things because it never stops blooming. You know, it's blooming now. It's big, biggest, showiest, um, most expressive season is early in the spring. But if it's in the sun, you know, it, you'll still find flowers in December, in January, it just never stops. So that's a really nice one. It also makes a really nice ground cover. Um, sometimes I get persnickety and feel compelled to cut back the flowering stalks, which sort of helps encourage more blooming and make um, the flower, the newer flowers uh, more visible because there's less foliage, but you certainly don't have to do that. Um, my, my feelings about cutting things back is, well, maybe I'm lazy, but also I'm trying to provide more habitat and, um, you know, resources for the critters. So I'm not much of a cutter backer, but I do work in a public garden. So I've got to, I have to, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes go with tidying for the sake of making native plants accessible to people who are unfamiliar, you know, with the big picture of 
gardening for biodiversity. So um, you can you can treat your green and gold um, in different ways, but it is a really nice ground cover. And I just love the um, way these different shades of yellow work together. So again, we're um, getting into a little bit later in the spring, but these guys are all the the Enothera is the tallest, maybe um, three, three-ish feet, three and a half in a, in a really good spot. Um, but, um, and the Coryophsis is a little bit shorter. And then that green and gold is closer to, you know, several inches to a foot. Um, and I've got a few more pictures of this combination. Another thing that I want to say about this, to go back to my happy accident theme, um, you can see better in this picture some other things in there with the flowers. You can see some grasses, some dicanthelliums. Dicanthelliums are tricky to tell apart, so I'm not even going to pretend that I know which one it is. I didn't plant it. It came in on its own. Um, that is true with any number of different species of dicanthelliums in the botanical garden, and they're really nice ground covers, nice filler. You can see sort of these... Um, you know, you can see the sort of fluffy little um, seed heads in there, which are nice. Um, and then the other thing in this picture is the potentilla or sink foil. If you look sort of in that green matrix, you um, can see this little five um, five leafed ground cover, which also has yellow flowers just doesn't happen to be flowering in this picture, which is another thing that just sort of came in on its own and is a really nice ground cover and works well with all of these other things. So um, they're native, they belong here, and they look good together. So I've just embraced the happy accident. Here's, here's one more. Obviously, I couldn't decide which picture I liked better, but as we get closer, you can see the potentilla and the dicanthelium a little bit better in there too. And here is the same set of yellows, but I've also um, added now the barber's buttons. So that's the, if you look at the, um, the plant names on the left there, that's the top one. And in the picture, it's the white. So same scale as these yellow guys. Um, it is mm, foot and a half, two feet tall. This is another one like the lobed tick seed that has um, good basal foliage. So this time of year, it's, you know, the flowers are long gone, although the flowering stalks on the Piedmont barber's buttons are sturdy enough that lots of places in the garden, I've left them in place and they're still up and still looking good. Um, so you can sort of treat them as a feature or not, um, depending on your own feelings about it, but the the basal foliage will still be there this time of year, making a nice ground cover to get you through the winter. So another idea for a combination. So here is that Coreopsis again, yet again. And now I've added um, lyre leaf sage. So a lot of you are probably familiar with lyre leaf sage as a thing that you sort of see on roadsides. I would say, um, I don't know, to call it a weed seems seems wrong, but it's a thing that, you know, just sort of pops up on its own here, there, and everywhere. It's got a really nice color to it. Um, as a garden plant, um, it's one of those things that um, flowers and fruits at the same time. So if you have a big mass of salvia lyrata and it gets to the, you know, like when it's first flowering, and you're just seeing these lovely flowers. It's it's lovely, but as it goes on, as the as it gets a little bit into for deeper into its flowering season, I don't love the look of it as much when it is in seed and flower at the same time. However, if it's growing with Coreopsis, it looks quite intentional and not weedy. So I guess what I, what I am saying is a big patch of lyre leaf sage to me can look weedy. But when combined with the Coreopsis, it looks totally horticultural, totally intentional. These are both, I've mentioned that the Coreopsis makes a good ground cover. 
The Lyrely Sage makes a really good ground cover. Um, the color of the basil foliage is nice. Um, it's green, but green to red to purple, there can be a lot of color in there. So another good um, ground cover. And I think that the two of them together are so much more interesting looking than either one alone. So this is a combination. This is another one that got real high marks with the horticulture staff at the botanical garden. Um, here is a closer up of the salvia and there's the Indian paintbrush hiding and it's not hiding Indian paintbrush doesn't hide except for this time of year. But um, there it is in the background and the, um, the Coreopsis yet again. And um, the salvia also works really nicely with the green and gold. I think the green and gold will do that same thing to sort of tone it down or um, I don't know, um, jazz it up, maybe tone it down is the right word. The, the green and gold will help jazz it up. So it's one that I like a lot um, for a lot of reasons, but generally with something else more than just by itself. Okay, um, when I first put this talk together, I described it as a thing that was gonna include, oh, grasses and perennials and woody things and I, in the end, really talked a lot about grasses and perennials and not so much about woody. So I had to sneak a woody plant in here, which is not what you're seeing. Um, you're seeing Eastern needlegrass. So this Pyptochidium avanaceum is just, I think, this absolutely wonderful plant that doesn't get nearly enough press. And if I can give one thing to Southeastern horticulture, I would like it to be this grass. Um, it's a great plant for dry shade. It looks awesome all the time. The big picture is in the middle of winter, but it also looks like that right now. The picture on the left is a little bit tricky to see, but when it blooms, the inflorescences are a lot taller. So the grass itself is just like this sort of small, maybe foot high, maybe a little bit taller than that, fine textured, well-behaved, super charming, clump. When it's in bloom, it's much taller, maybe three feet tall, um, very graceful. Um, the seeds are really pokey and painful. So ultimately, at one point, you'll probably find yourself feeling compelled to clean it up and you'll get one of those seeds stuck in your sock and it'll be irritating you hours later. But you won't really mind because you're so happy that you have Pyptochidium growing in your garden. You can see that there's some color in that picture on the left and that is actually um, a trumpet flower flower that has fallen and gotten hung up in the flowering stalks of the Pyptochidium, which blooms in the spring. And you can see our ubiquitous little green and gold in that picture as well. But the plant that I'm selling in combination with this Pyptochidium is actually a woody plant, which is what I was working my way up to in that intro, that long introduction, um, which is a dewberry. It blooms, the blue, the dewberry blooms in the spring um, when everything is quiet. And this is another one of those combinations that was pre-existing in the Piedmont habitat at the Botanical Garden. It was a set of plants that just happened, you know, that was there because it put itself there. We did not engineer this. And um, dewberry could be a hard sell as a horticultural plant um, because as pokey as the Pyptochidium seeds are, they're not anything compared to um, working around a blackberry, um, very pokey. But the flowers are so beautiful in the spring. It's a great wildlife plant. Um, and it looks really good with the Pyptochidium. So um, this was a combination of me trying to work a woody plant into my mostly perennials talk and trying to work Pyptochidium in as something that was a good plant combination. Um, so it's a stretch, but I do think that this dewberry is a nice plant. If you don't get to eat it, the critters will eat it. Um, and it, it, you know, it's not, it's not a shrub. This is a trailing prostrate um, rubus and less pokey than a lot of them. Okay, so we have left spring behind and we are into early summer now. 
and I have reverted to form, although I guess that last set was too. I'm back in Piedmont plants. But this is um, wild quinine is the white on the left with um, spiked wild indigo, which is not in bloom in this picture, but you're seeing these sort of glaucous green seed pods in the plant on the right. Both of these plants are um, taller than all of the other plants that I've talked about so far. So as we get later in the season, the perennials tend to get a little bit taller. Um, they're fighting harder to get a little bit more sun. And um, these are both fairly coarse perennials. So we are in the three and a half foot range now getting taller. Um, everything about the wild quinine is coarse. The foliage is literally coarse. Um, there's nothing delicate about this plant. The flowers are not super showy individually, but collectively they're really nice. Um, the Baptisia, again, these, you know, they, when they flower, there's not a whole lot of foliage. So as they're blooming, um, it's a little bit more of a delicate plant, but as the season goes on and it's seed, seed pods are developing and it's putting on more foliage, it's, you know, robust and shrub-like, um, but sort of a contrast you know, I wouldn't say that really anything about the um, spiked wild indigo is delicate, but the foliage is a lot softer. The color of the foliage is softer. And I think it's a really nice contrast with the wild quinine. These are both sun plants um, and they're both quite drought tolerant. Um, the wild quinine, if it's happy enough, will spread vegetatively. It has really interesting rhizomes. It's maybe not fun to dig it up, but it's really interesting to dig it up. Um, the roots are quite black and thick and just neat, neat looking. So anyway, I like these two together a lot. Um, here we can see the same set a little bit closer. You can see those developing seed heads on the Baptisia a little bit better. You get a better sense of the foliage on both plants. And here's a close up of the flowers on the parthenium. Um, this is a really nice pollinator plant. You can see a bee and a little skipper there. A lot of different um, pollinators are drawn to the parthenium flowers and um, it is also a fairly long bloomer, um, especially if you have a decent sized patch of it. It'll keep going for a while. You think it's done and then it'll throw up another flowering stalk. You're like, okay, here we go again. It's also, both of these plants are really nice as the season goes on. Um, even this time of year, they have nice winter interest. So they're um, sturdy and they, um, they do nice things in the garden. Here's the flower. So I got this far without showing the flowers on the wild indigo. So unlike a lot of the other Baptisias, the spiked wild indigo, this albescence is, um, when it's in bloom, the, there aren't, it's sort of sparsely flowered on long flowering stalks. The shape of the plants, um, I think is very interesting and architectural. It's not quite this like big ball of foliage that you sometimes see there. Um, they just have a more interesting shape to them. So I, I, it's maybe less traditionally horticultural than a lot of the Baptisias that you can get your hands on, but perhaps more interesting, says someone who's in love with the Piedmont plants. Okay, oh God, I've done it again. Here's another Piedmont plant. Um, Rattlesnake Master is one that probably most of you guys are already familiar with. I, I never fail to put it any doesn't matter what I'm talking about there's always a rattlesnake master slide it's such a great plant um, it's wonderful in the spring because its foliage looks so good as it starts to come up you can see the the foliage in this slide um, the um, botanical name Orangium yuccifolium comes from the fact that the foliage looks like a yucca um, it's a nice color I'll use the word glaucus again but a pretty um, blue green as it comes up and then of course the flowers are wonderful. It attracts so many crazy different pollinators, um, so many interesting wasps and um, you know bees and butterflies and all of the good stuff. And then it's a really great plant for winter interest. So this is wonderful in the garden um, until you choose to cut it back or choose not to cut it back. 
You can't see it as well, but in the background here, I have um, some hoary skull cap. So the next picture, you will see a better shot of that. So there's the hoary skull cap. In the foreground, it's another one of these things, another mountain plant that we grew from seed and planted out around the education center. And it was amazing, um, has such a long bloom time, attracts so many neat pollinators. Um, the fact that we grew it all from seed um, caused us to have this fun variation where you can see that some of the plants here are actually white flowered, mixed in with the blue flowered. And unlike the salvia lyrata, when this plant, because it has such a long bloom time, it's definitely um, in flower and fruit at the same time. But the seed capsules on this plant are so good looking that um, they're just, you know, it's not, it's not a deterrent or a detractant at all. So um, a, this hoary skull cap is just a wonderful thing. It just, it really does bloom forever. Um, we're again, sort of all in that same scale, three and a half to four feet now. And then you can see in the background, um, the threadleaf tick seed, the Coryoptis particulata. So um, smaller um, and more floriferous flowers or more, more flowers than the, um, the Coryopsis auriculata that I talked about earlier. This is a little bit taller, um, three-ish three feet, I would say, but um, quite delicate because of that foliage. The um, foliage is very feathery. It's a nice contrast to the um, hoary skull cap or the um, Oryngium, the rattlesnake master, because it's quite delicate compared to the coarseness of the other two. And it's a really nice color combination, I think, as well. So um, we're into the summer now. Moving deeper into the summer is cardinal flower. Cardinal flower is always like one of the biggest visitor favorites at the garden. And this is a plant that I had really struggled um, to be successful with for a lot of years. Couldn't figure out how to make it live. People say, oh, it's important not to mulch the basil rosette in the winter. Well, okay, I know that. I've never mulched the basil rosette in the winter. Why can't I get it to live? Well, it likes moist soil. Okay, I've planted it in a place with moist soil. Um, it likes to die. It likes to rot. Um, I think what I have learned is that the secret is to just grow a lot of it all together. So it's, I would say, a short-lived perennial. But if you have a lot of them and they're all seeding in, you know, each cardinal flower does make a lot of seed, then I think that is the trick to the fact that this patch has survived for as long as it does. So you've got to commit to a big patch of it. Um, and, you know, maybe that can get a little bit boring, but I think it's really nice in combination with the downy lobelia, the lobelia puberula. So that's what you're seeing in the larger picture here. Um, it's taller than the cardinal flower and um, narrower. Um, the flowers are a little bit smaller and less showy, but the foliage is quite nice looking, um, just a little bit fuzzy, uh, but it the cardinal flower, um, the foliage tends to get a little bit ratty, and I think even more so with the great blue lobelia. So the great blue lobelia, the inset picture there, will give you that same color combination, and they can both, they're both happy enough in the same set of growing conditions, but I'm never satisfied with the way the blue lobelia foliage looks, whereas the downy lobelia foliage I think is great, and I do like that tall skinniness with the cardinal flower and I like the color combination. So if you're forced to um, have a whole bunch of it because that's how you are successful in making it live, it's nice to have some other plant in there to give it some contrast too. That's, I like that downy lobelia for that. Okay, we're getting a little bit later in the season now. So um, we are into the late summer, early fall. Um, we had, um, Zeta come through last week and blow all the petals off of our swamp sunflower. So that was the end of our, Zeta was the end of our swamp sunflower display this year. So um, the swamp sunflower is quite tall, um, three to 
maybe even seven feet tall. Um, this picture, it's a little bit tipped over, so you can see all of these things together. The um, the aromatic aster in there is is considerably shorter, maybe three feet tall. Really nice mounding aster. Um, this is a combination for the sun for sure. And then there's that white Kostoletsky, that white seashore mallow. So if you're familiar with the regular pink, you know, the regular old seashore mallow is pink, not white. But the white flowered form blooms later than the pink one does. So it's a nice, I think these three are a nice color combination. They bloom at the same time. Um, I'm always selling people on the idea that they should plant the purple fall asters because they're such late bloomers they provide resources for the pollinators late in the season when there aren't that many things out there um, some people say that they have had success with this aromatic aster in places with deer um, i can't say that i've had that experience but it is super sticky so when you're working with it you get it on your hands and that might, that's i think for some some deer some people's deer some places a deterrent um, so maybe worth trying but so this is a this is a tall combination. Um, the Kostoletsky is also like five, six, seven feet tall. And you can see it in the um, that fall color picture of the Father Gila. That green in the foreground is the um, seashore mallow and it's with its developing seed capsules there. So you don't necessarily get the fall color with the white flowers, the father gala fall color with the um, seashore mallow white flowers, but they are of a, um, they're a nice scale to grow together as all, you know, all these four are all of a similar scale. They all like the sun, um, average to moist soil. I think that um, aromatic aster is, is um, a fairly tolerant, um, and will will accept all kinds of indignities from the soil and the swamp sunflower if you grow it in a drier spot it'll be shorter um, and you know probably sometimes more upright um, than it is in a wet spot when it tends to grow a little bit bigger and sturdier some people like to cut it back to keep it shorter um, so that's an option if you don't want it to be as tall if you don't want it to fall over but um, not the only option. Okay, so when I initially put this talk together, the combinations were a little bit based on things that I had really nice pictures of. And um, they're also, it also skews a lot towards um, what works in the sun, because we do have a lot of sun at the botanical garden here. And I think a lot of home gardeners around here don't have as much sun. And even though I didn't have great pictures of either of these two, this is a combination that has given me a lot of joy in my own quite shady, um, not particularly dry garden at home this fall. So the white wood aster and the axillary goldenrod are both quite shade tolerant um, and they bloom late in the year and um, to a greater or lesser degree, they're both kind of floppy sprawlers, so neither are excellent upright specimen plants, but together um, they're really nice and, you know, to get some color like this in the shade um, is also a nice treat. So I decided to put this in here for myself so that I would have something new to talk about and for all of you guys like me who garden mostly in the shade. This is a nice one. Someday I'll get a better picture of it. Um, okay, so this is the time of year when all of the native grasses are really doing their thing. Um, I came and spoke to you guys live and in person a few years back, and it was a Piedmont centric talk. And when I put up a picture of little blue stem and talked about how it's one of my favorite things all around the room. People were nodding their heads and murmuring like, oh, yes, little blue stem. And I thought, oh, this is the most wonderful place to be. So here's the little blue stem slide um, in combination with eastern gray goldenrod. Sometimes people are afraid of goldenrods because they can be aggressive. But the eastern gray goldenrod is one that doesn't really spread rhizomatously. It does seed in a little bit, but I've certainly not found it to be a problem. 
it looks really nice with the little blue stem. Everything looks really nice with the little blue stem. This time of year, how can we not just love the little blue stem? But these are both um, good for dry sites, good for sunny sites. And the um, Saladago probably finished blooming about a month ago, um, but it still looks nice. And the little blue stem is still looking great. So I have following this a whole bunch more grass pictures. So this is the pink muley grass. Um, as it gets a little bit later in the season, it stops being so pink, but it's still quite dramatically fluffy and works really nice with so many of our um, purple fall asters. Um, some of our, some of my favorite purple fall asters like the Symphiotricum grandiflorum and Symphiotricum patens in particular, they don't have the most um, tidy upright form. They tend to be floppy and sprawly. And if you combine them with something like the Muhlenbergia, um, so the, the hair grass is probably, um, I don't know, in the three and a half, four foot range. And so these asters, as they sprawl in and amongst the hair grass, it's a really nice combination. The Eastern silvery aster can be a little bit more upright. Here's another picture. And um, this has some nodding Indian grass um, above it as well. Um, it was just so beautiful this year. The nodding Indian grass, it's another Sergastrum. So most of us are probably familiar with Sergastrum nutans. Sergastrum eliadii has just got the most beautiful color. It's kind of a sable brown, um, a really nice shape to it. The downside of this one as compared to the um, Sergastrum nutans is it's not real sturdy. So it looks great now, um, but it's not the sort of thing that's going to be good for winter interest in your garden when um, when it's fin when it starts to drop, when it starts to lose its seeds, the flowering stalks tend to fall and break and it does require a little bit of tidying up if you're a tidier or not if you're not but um, it's not going to be a good winter grass like the andropogons and the um, the more common sergastrum are, but really nice with these asters and the Muhlenbergia. Here's another picture because I love it so much. And here is a close up of the patents. I don't have a I didn't put in a lot of pictures of the of the different asters, but um, this is a this is a nice one, the clasping American aster, and you can see some. Um, some nice andropogons behind it there. Okay, so here's the um, eastern silvery aster again, the con color, which is of, you know, there are so many different purple asters around here in the fall and telling which one you're looking at can sometimes lead to a lot of head scratching, but the, the con color is nice because it has these um, oppressed silvery leaves. I think it kind of looks like seaweed and it does, often tend to be more upright, although not always. And here it is with split beard blue stem, um, which is another one of the combinations that got high marks from the NCBG horticultural staff. So in the fall, um, the, the con color is, well, all of these fall asters are still blooming. They won't be blooming for that much longer, but they're still doing their thing. And the um, Split beard blue stem is also doing its thing, and the low, the low angled fall light shining through the um, seed heads on that split beard blue stem, and the eastern silvery aster threaded through is such a nice showstopper right now. In the bigger picture, you can see in the background some fall color from actually one of those things is a sourwood, but the other is a blueberry, Vaccinium fuscatum. So here is a closer up of the Vaccinium fuscatum with those really nice, um, those seed heads on that split beard blue stem are just like sparkling in this picture. So this is about, um, you know, this is about this time of year. The Vaccinium is, is just starting to color up. So this pic these pictures are probably taken just a little bit later last year. But um, another opportunity to showcase a woody plant. Um, 
this vaccinium is another good one that's got a lot of wildlife value. Um, you know, the critters can eat the fruits. Um, it's got really nice fall color. It blooms very early in the spring. And even before it starts to bloom, it buds up quite early. So it's just fun to watch those buds develop and remember that um, sooner or later it will be spring again and things will be blooming. So I think here's, here's that um, vaccinium with a little bit of frost on it. So not, we haven't had this yet this year. These pictures were taken last year. And that is, with me talking really fast, um, my perennial combinations. 